I will be given by Professor Fan Bo Han from New York University. Uh, he will speak on the planet's energy in Dimension 3, revisited. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizer for invitation. So, actually, Panis operator was written by Panis probably in the 80s. But, uh, so, originally sort of like an algebraic result. So, but uh, in probably like uh, uh, 25 years ago, uh, based on some many works of Ellis and uh, Paul and uh, his students and the uh, courses. You know. And uh, this start with actually start with a uh, problem in spe spectral geometry, like log determinant. So then after that, there is a dramatical, dramatical turn in probably 20 years ago. They uh, have some uh, very interesting discovery in uh, four dimensional conformal geometry, like. Uh, Performance sphere theorem, actually, Alice mentioned this morning. So, this Panic operator actually does not just work in four dimensions, in three dimensions, or five or more dimensions. They also have Panic operator. So, today I'm going to focus on three dimension ones because this is, I'm interested in this because this has very special analytical property. So, let's try to see firstly what is Panic operator in three dimensions. So in three dimension, actually the Panis operator is a Laplace, uh, the leading operator is Laplacian score. So then you add some uh, add some middle terms, which is divergence of rich curvature. But here EI, EI just means you take any local orthonormal frame. You see it, that does not depend on which local orthonormal frame you take. Then that's the divergence of that vector field. Then you have a constant term. Constant term here, the Q is actually so called the Q curvature. So now, what is the Q curvature? Actually, here it's very important. For example, like, like uh, just uh, uh, this second talk uh, this afternoon, that uh, when you write on the GGMS operator, you just say Laplacian 2K plus lower the terms. Here it's very important. We have an explicit formula. Actually, the formula here is very important for us. For example, you can observe immediately when the scalar curvature is ze zero, actually, the Q curvature is negative for force of the case, and this is really important for us. So now, but uh, you might say, why are you interested in such, you know, this is complicated, why don't I just do scalar culture? So the reason is because, the reason things have become so complicated because Laplacian score does not satisfy conformal invariant property. However, if you do add these lower order terms, you satisfy this property. Here, it's actually root to power minus four. Originally, it should be four, 4 over n minus 4, but n equal to 3, you get minus 4. So it's something like this. Now, once you have rest, you immediately de derive the Q curvature transformation law. So suppose you take the GQ term, do this transformation, then the new Q curvature is just equal to this original one. But unlike the conformal scalar curvature case, this is a negative one. The reason is because on the top, here is a negative sign. That makes big difference. So now, these are the order formulas. So now, let's see. OK, so this is a familiar uh, phase. So this guy can be compared with a conformal Laplacian operator. Conformal Laplacian operator, of course, you know, it's, it's, it's motivated from the study of scalar curvature. Because when you try to compute the, uh, the, the transformation of a scalar curvature, you automatically come up with conformal Laplacian op operator. So conformal Laplacian operator satisfies that. It's basically just Laplacian plus a potential term, which is scalar culture, which is much easier because there is no middle term anymore. Everything is determined by the potential term. So it satisfies a similar law. OK, I, I think people here is know this very well. And it's time to introduce this. Uh, you have this uh, transformation law. You see, th this looks quite similar. Yes. You see, this looks very similar here. This one. Okay. Ways. This one. This is transformational here. Then on the top here, you have Q culture transformation. But here you have minus sign. Okay. This actually many times it confuses people. So now. Now let me try to give you some examples. Of course, the easiest one. 
is on on flat spaces, all the curvature disappears. So it's just Laplacian score. But unfortunately, you see, just Laplacian score. People usually call it a bi Laplacian. There used to be many. Actually, bi Laplacian appears at the same time as Laplacian. But uh, you know, later on, there's lots of lots of study of Laplacian, but not bi Laplacian. Why? Because you cannot do anything about it. Even very simple question, you cannot answer about them. For Laplacian, it's totally different. Of course, for example, the typical thing, we, we know the Laplacian score does not satisfy uh, maximum principle. For example, you, you cannot, for Laplacian, there is a very simple comparison theorem for the first eigenvalue, which says if the volume is equal to the unit ball, then the eigenvalue of the Dirichlet eigenvalue of Laplacian is bigger than the ball, ball's eigenvalue. But for the bi Laplacian, this is still an open question for, for uh, n from 4 or above. I mean, even this simple question you cannot answer. That's the first example. Now the next example, on S3, actually Q coverage is positive, is 15 over 8, we are the number. Then the panic operator, you see, because it's Einstein metric, so the rich coverage is just, just equal to constant multiplied uh, uh, matrix. So the panic operator is just a, a polynomial of Laplacian. You see? So once you diagonalize, diagonalize Laplace, you diagonalize polynomials, right? So they have the same eigenfunctions. So you can easily compute eigenvalues. This is just eigenvalue corresponding to eigenfunction one. So it has only one negative eigenvalue, but then starting from second eigenvalue, it's positive. So here, this is a very weird thing. You see, essentially, Sn is not far from Rn. And of course, uh, when you talk to top, uh, topology people, you say Sn is almost Rn. They will you know, kill you because that's not true. But here, Sn, actually, you have the minus point that's conformal equal to Rn. So now, you see, on S3, on, suppose on R3, the Laplacian score is actually non negative different. But why on S3, you have, it has a negative eigenvalue? I mean, because you plug in one, the energy is negative. So, however, on Sn, the conformal Laplacian is positive different. But on S3, it has a negative eigenvalue. Why they don't match? The reason is very straightforward. Because you have to de delete one point to make it IN. But the one point in the sublift space cases, in the uh, conformal Laplacian space cases, that's a so-called H1 sublift capacity. In the H1 sublift spaces, one point does not matter at all. But in the H2 capacities space, H2 of a point is positive. Why? Because H2 of S3 is hold continuous. So, or in another word, it's, uh, in a very, this is a fancy word, it's called the capacity, but in a very simple word, it just means the following. Let's say I take the unit ball. Now I take any strobe function in H1. I can always approximate them by functions which vanishes nearby here. But let's say I take any function on H2, that's not true anymore because, because if, if you take, let's just take one, it, it cannot be approximated by zero here because once it, because the sublime embedding on S3 is containing C half. So once it converges, it will converge uniformly. That's not true anymore. One point, you cannot delete it. So that, that's the reason you, you have this weird phenomenon. Actually, this observation is very important later on. OK, so that's the next example. The third example, on S2 cross S1. So here, the panic operator, actually, you can write down everything. It's sep separation variable. So the eigenfunctions are just uh, homo homogeneous harmonic polynomial on S2, then the trigonometric polynomial on S1. So, uh, so you multiply them. So, so, so the first eigenvalue actually is positive. So now it's a positive different. You see, on S3, it has a negative eigenvalue. But on S2 cross S1, it has, a, it has no negative eigenvalue. They both have positive scalar curvature. So the last example, you see, because we are in three dimension, S3 is actually very special because S3 is a Lie group. S3 can be written as SU2. This is actually an example that, uh, that, uh, that the people study the collapsing that really enjoy this example. The reason, how do we do it? So you just take the Lie algebra. Now you, you take this, a base here. Now you just make one of the vector, the first vector, names as T. The other two, then you make them orthogonal, the other two as a, as a unit vector. These people call this Bourget sphere. You see, when t goes to zero, okay, that's that's uh, that's a that's a very nice example of collecting. So.
So now the scalar closure is actually this. The Q closure is this. When t equal to 1, that's just S3. Now when t near 1, the Q closure is positive. It has a one negative egg value and only one negative egg value. When t is too big or too small, then Q closure is negative, but the first egg value is positive. So this is a homogeneous uh, space example. This example is important because in this case, by some algebra, you know all the egg values and egg function. Right. OK, so now these are the basic examples. So th this one thing that is really nice. You see, for the S3 and S1 cross S2, they both have positive scalar curvature. But on S3, this panic operator has one negative egg value. On S1 cross S2, they don't. So the panic operator separated them out. All right. So now, what's the Q curvature equation? Then what is the panic energy? So now, OK, let's start with a simple equation. So suppose you do the conformal transformation, GQ that equal to u to the power negative 4G. If you want the Q equal to constant, it just means PU equal to constant multiplied e u to uh, power minus 7. You see, here, unfortunately, you have a minus sign here. This is actually, in the Yamabe problem case, you have n plus 2 n minus 2. You don't in general like minus sign because that means when you touch zero, you have trouble. So that's one of the analytical obstructions we are going to meet. Then you have this quadratic energy associated with panic operator. You know, you, you, that means you just do the integrating part, you get this. Now you can, one way to solve this equation is you take this energy. You see, you just take this quadratic form. Now you multiply this. Then you take inf of it. So this way actually was first proposed by Xu and uh, Paul many years ago. So this one is actually nothing. This is just uh, the total Q curvature functional, but uh, up to a negative constant, not up to a positive constant. So here you take inf. When you take total Q curvature functional, you, you take a, a shoop, not inf, because there is a negative constant here. So now. Here, you want to do the inf. So if you can find that the inf is, it e exists, okay, then that solves the q curvature equation. By the way, it's very important. Unlike the Yamabe problem, of course, if you solve this, this inf infinite problem, you solve that. But uh, if you study this inequality, study this variational problem, it only leads to the solution of the q curvature indirectly. What do I mean indirectly? That means, when you study this problem, you introduce some technique or something which will solve that easily. You don't have to solve this problem because this problem do not always have a solution. But later on, I will tell you uh, lesser than sufficient condition when it has a solution. So I, I would say the study of this inf infinite one actually leads to the solution of Q culture equation is indirectly, it's not directly. All right, so now, Okay, so now here there is something that is really interesting. Suppose Q curvature is positive. Now I just plug in phi equal to one. This energy will be negative. So that when you take inf, that means this value could be negative. Suppose u is very close to zero. This guy could be really huge. Then if the if the energy is also negative, then you multiply them. That could be go to minus infinity. So does this happen or not? So this is actually really subtle analytical problem. So now. For example, on S3, is this minus infinity or not? This actually is not, is something really funny. So now, actually probably 20 years ago, that uh, Paul and uh, one of the students, uh, one of the posts of the Jew actually proved this. On S3, you see, this, originally you say it might, might, might be minus infinity, but actually it's not. It actually, it has an infinite mom, and the infinite mom just take value, you just take u equal to one. That means standard sphere achieves the minimum. So this is a very funny inequality. Of course, you want to ask, what about other minimizers? Well, those are just like the Yamaha problem. It's quite, kind of fairly straightforward. You just 
look, take the equation, even though it's false order equation, but you can still do moving plane method. The, the way to do it is by you transform it to integral equations, then you'll get. So the critical points are just like you can identify them all. So now, Paul and myself has still many uh, different proofs for them. But today, today I'm going to describe a very different proof. The reason is, the reason I'm interested in this proof is because, you see, there is a very, there is a, there is a method to prove the sharp sub inequality is called subcritical approximation. But when you talk to people about this conformal invariant inequality, people always say, okay, I have a, why don't you have a subcritical approximation for this? But you see, now you just meet different problems. Here you have negative power. What is subcritical approximation? So, so the situation will be different. So instead, you need to figure out some kind of perturbation problem, which you can easily find a minimizer. Then you take a limit. So, the, so then why I, I would like to do this process? The reason is because this process will introduce a new way to do maturation for false order equations. Okay, so that's what I'm going to explain now. So firstly, you have a standard sub living inequality. Okay, that's the one probably studied many times. You have tons of proofs. Okay, basically everyone is interesting. I would say if you have 10 proofs, you shouldn't go line because different proofs really give you different perspective. So now, how do you do this? So the idea is this, first you prove this guy actually is achieved, then you prove it, once you, you, you know it's achieved, then you, you standard uh, like a uh, uh, way, like a uh, moving plane method will tell you the minimizer is what. So, so but uh, when you prove it's achieved, you have a problem. That's so-called loss of components because H1 does not embed into L2 and N minus, that's called critical ex exponent. So the idea that is you just decrease the power. So that's the reason you call subcritical power. Method. You just take this. This one is very easy to say it's achieved. It's actually just two line argument, direct method of calculus. So now, so now the perturbation equation, critical point looks like this. ALU equal to U to power Q minus one. Q is less than the critical power. Now, you use method of moving plan to show this equation has only constant solution. So that means the minimizer must be constant. So that means for the all the subcritical, you prove this. Now you just let Q go to 2 and N minus 2. You get a sharp inequality. So this is called a sharp. This is called a subcritical approximation method. You see, one way to solve the problem is to do this on any, on general manifold is to do this subcritical approximation method. Right, because that will, here, the main problem is because you lose components, now you just uh, decrease the power, then you get components. Of course, on three manifold, on three manifold, you still, you still do not have components. So H2M, this is not compact, so M is three manifold. Of course, we know that if I minus the epsilon here, that will be compact, but that does not help us, right? So now I want to. So we ask the following. The first question that I want to ask is, if you want to do find a perturbation problem, what what is the perturbation problem? Now, firstly, I want to. So the main point is, how do we formulate the perturbation problem? Of course, it's not you decrease the power. So here, okay. Unfortunately, if I want to explain this clearly, I have to say a little bit detail because. Unfortunately, you have to, you know, we have seen too much formulas today, but uh, I'm sorry about this, so let's try to do this. Because this is the only way. This is bare hand analysis, which I like. I don't, okay, because we do not have heavy machinery here. Everything is bare hand. So now, you look at this problem. How do you know it's achieved? Okay, why don't we just do direct method of calculus of variation? Let the UI be a minimizing sequence. Now, here, you do not normalize the volume one, because that will not give you a limit. So here is very different. I normalize maximum of ui equal to one. Why can you do this? Because the, 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 the taste functions are, are hold continuous, so we have no trouble with that. So then, because this is bounded by one, so minimize sequence, because the whole thing is bounded, so the energy is bounded. But it's L infinity bounded, so the H2 is bounded. You have minimize sequence, ui goes to you weakly. Now, because this embedded to C half, so that the ui will converge to you. Uniformly. So now here, there, here it comes the problem. 
If U is positive, then you have a minimizer. That's easy. But you could touch zero. So once you touch zero, then maximum equal to one because it's converges uniformly. Now just that's a key point. Once it touches zero, the L in L6 norm is infinity. That's the first one. You see, once this guy is infinity, you move things around. That means the energy U is non-positive. So this is a, just a bare high analysis. You don't need to do anything, any heavy machinery like this. So now, okay, once you kill this assumption, once you kill this, you win. You know that there is a minimizer, but how do you kill this? So that's, a, that's the thing. That's a very weird ad hoc condition we proposed like 20 years ago. I mean, if you look at it, that's really weird. We say the planet operator satisfies condition P. P means positivity. If for any function phi belongs to H2, if phi touches zero for some, some phi, then energy phi is positive. So we call this a positivity condition. So now, the behind the discussion just tell you, condition P tells why 4G is achieved. It's not just achieved, minimizing sequence. Minimizers are compact. So, so then you ask, when does condition P? When is condition P satisfied? Is it, is it fire is that it should run or maybe? <laughs> right, good. Okay. So now the first one is you see the phi test function has to touch zero somewhere. Okay, what you say why you want to touch zero? Because that's the obstacle. You have this ob simplest obstacle in this case. So if the punish object is positive, clearly punish P is satisfied, right? So this is a condition actually the first studied by uh, Paul and, uh, and Xi Wang. Now, now, S3 cannot satisfy condition P. Why? Because if it satisfies condition P, then the minimizer will be compact, but S3 has this non-compact movie transmit group, so it cannot satisfy condition P. But it satisfies so-called condition non-negativity. That's almost condition P. That means if phi belongs to H2, if it touches zero somewhere, then energy may not be positive, but it's at least non-negative. Why is non-negative? Because once it touches zero, it's basically touches zero in a neighborhood because I can approximate that way. Then I can move it to Euclidean place, which is non-negative, so we are done. You see, this does not contradict with first eigenvalue, which is negative, because one does not touch zero. You see, we almost satisfy condition P. So now, to go from condition A to condition P, I just need to do a little bit thing. That's exactly, that exactly tells us what's the, what's, the, what's the formulation of this equation. So now, then I will, before I go to the formulation of the, of the perturbation equation, I want to say, if you just go to two, two-fold colony, that's satisfied condition P. Why? In fact, in fact, you ask, when this, when this equality is achieved, that's exactly the Green's function. And then the Green's function of this panic operator is this. Let me write down this here. Green's function of punish operator on S3. You see, this is really simple, any manual function. So if you ask, what's the Green function of Laplace score plus one, you are done. It's a special function. I cannot write them down. There is no way to, I know whether it's positive or negative. But for Green function of punish operator, it's any manual function. Why? How do you get this? Because you just first derive a, a Green's function of Laplacian score on the plane, then you do a transformation, now you get this. So this function only touches zero once. So on, when you have a two-fold covering, it, it will touch twice. So it's done. Right. So, so now, but this is not yet. So, okay, 20 years ago, and Paul and I did really, I mean, really hard work to prove that, 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 that Actually, Bourdieu sphere is condition P. This is not easy anymore because you think of a Bourdieu sphere. Why? How? How do you know that? How do you know that S three is condition double n? You have to develop everything to R n. But the Bourdieu sphere, whatever, you, if you delete a point, if you develop everything, what is it? Nothing. You you don't know anything. So that's based on a very careful calculation of the Green's function of value at the pole. They have close relation with that. So now, uh, probably two years ago. Uh, that's more recent. Then Paul and I finally found one condition. So now, in fact, if 
you have positive Yamaha class. If the Q curve is positive, then the, the, the penis operator satisfy condition double N. If and only if second egg value is positive. You see, this one is much easier to understand because in general we believe linear things are easier, but the second egg value is linear thing. It satisfies condition P if and only if first the second egg value is positive. Next, this guy is not conformal diffeomorphic to the standard S3. This is sort of like positive mass theorem type thing. So if I have time, I will explain this a little bit, but uh, that, 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 basically, that basically tells us what happens near S3. You see, original on S3, I, we always based on if I delete one point, it, I, become, I become R3. Even if I just perturb the matrix a little bit, I'm done. I cannot do anything anymore. And you cannot even check, even though you know all the eigenvalues, all the eigenfunctions, you cannot prove this condition P. But this makes life really easier. If you just perturb this a little bit, say for example, like near the sphere, the second eigenvalue is still positive, so it must satisfy condition P. All right, but now, I want to formulate the perturbation problem. You see, the P only satisfies condition non neg N, N. So, how do you go pass from condition N, N to condition P? You just, okay, plus a epsilon. Yeah, yes, that becomes condition po, uh, P. So, E epsilon phi equal to P plus epsilon phi. Now, you can, instead of consider E phi, you consider E epsilon phi. Now it's sign condition P. You can easily prove this guy has a minimizer. That's really easy. Just the bare, kind argument I, pro I provide at the beginning. If the volume is equal to one, then this guy satisfies this equation. Now, here is the problem. Actually, I think maybe two years ago or three years ago, I, I, I know this approximation, but uh, I always thought I prove this u equal to one is really easy. I can do it really easily because I know this should be done by moving plane. For some reason, if some problem can be done by moving plane, it can be done already because you know there are just so many people in that field, unfortunately. So, but uh, for this one, I tried. I cannot do it. Okay. Basic reason is uh, the, way, the way to do it is, is you have to you have to study carefully the the, the, the kernel of this p plus epsilon. But there are some calculus inequality I cannot prove, unfortunately. But uh, never mind because I can avoid. Now let's assume I don't have this, even though I believe this is really true. I mean, you should try it. It's, a, uh, it's actually a very good exercise to learn moving plane method, okay, if you haven't learned before. If it works out, of course, that's good. But it didn't work out, at least for me. So, so actually, now I, I'm thinking of doing C-maturation. You see, C-maturation only works very well for second order equations. The, the biggest, the, for example, a very easy example is this, which I just said at the beginning. If, if the, Volume is equal to ball B1. This is a really beautiful theorem that they proved as first egg value. How do we do this? I can write down this in two lines. Because you just take any test function, then divide by integral omega phi square. It's bigger than or equal to integral ball B1, gradient phi square, star square. This is a proof of it, and uh, this is, you, you know, this symmetrization process is really useful. For example, like prove the most of trading inequality, you know, many times you reduce the problem to radial symmetric functions. However, okay, this is really nice. The only thing bad is it does not work for certain other things, and it's not true. Okay, just uh, make this. Okay, maybe if you don't know this problem, I should let you know maybe. For example, if n equal to 2 or 3, if you look at lambda 1 Laplacian score omega, that's still true. And the proof is not easy anymore. Okay. You, you cannot use symmetrization. But the proof is, is done by uh, Ladivici. But when n is bigger than or equal to 4, you don't know. That's still open. Even as simple as that, it doesn't work. So now, how do you do this? I, I cannot reduce this problem to, to phi, radial symmetric. So how do I do this? So now the method is this. I cannot do it symmetrically for every test function. However, I'm going to show, I, I'm going to do symmetrization only for minimizers. 
So this is a critical point. So what's the point about minimizer? Because minimizer satisfy additional equation falsely, suddenly minimizes. You know, the n is the smallest one. So you have a little bit of comparison. So in this case, you can do. So the closure point here is the following. Unlike a classical symmetrization approach, this works for every case function. The method I'm, I, I'm going to show you, it only works for min minimizers. So, so for this one, symmetrization method to work, you must know the minimizer already exists. But that's the easy part. Okay, so now let me try to, but uh, how do we do this? The first ingredient is you know the Green's function. So here, maybe let me try to explain a little bit. You see, for high order equations, how do you do things? Usually, of course, you do not have maximum principle. Sometimes, if you know sufficient information about the kernel, it will save you. So let me show you some examples. So the first example is so-called Adams inequality. You see, most of trading inequality has a high order extension done by Adams, but that was done by integral machine. So there is another guy called Fontana. Actually, he, imp he uh, extends the so-called uh, motor trading inequality to high order Laplacian, right, on manifold. How do we do that? Again, you have to resort to the Green's function of Laplacian, high order equations. So Actually, Ellis and Paul also did that because they needed that for Penny's operator. I think they did it in dimension four too, right? So the firstly, but you know Green's function of Penny's operator explicitly there, and in many function. Once you know that, you can write down Green's function of Penny's operator plus Ipsho explicitly. It's an infinite series. And based on that thing, actually you can say Penny's operator is actually, because this is invariant on the orthogonal transformation, so this guy is actually a function k minus k epsilon of x dot with y. Why I write minus k epsilon? Because it's a negative thing. And the k epsilon is a positive, strictly decreasing function. That's very important. So now, that's the first ingredient. I know the kernel explicitly. Next ingredient, yes. There is a, there is a symmetry result for integral, for uh, by Bernstein Taylor. Actually, Bernstein is a, uh, do a harmonic analysis, but uh, I think he has some nice results in, in, uh, in two dimension. But then he wants to say, I want to generalize to high dimension. That ends up with this. This is, this is just if k is, is decreasing, when you do symmetries of the functions, the, the whole energy actually becomes smaller, not bigger. If k is increasing, that becomes bigger. Right, that's the second ingredient. By the way, this is a, this is a so-called Reed's rearrangement inequality on Rn. It basically says integral f x g y then h x minus y dx dy that's bounded by integral f star g star. Everything becomes star. This is called the Reed's rearrangement inequality. Actually, this is a generation to, to the sphere. There is, no, there is no four generation, but this is one generation. But this is sufficient for us. So the third ingredient is the following. Uh, here, I, I, don't, I do not want to write the detail, but uh, actually here, how do you, suppose you have a U, now you do symmetrization, then you solve it for V. Then you actually show the V is again extreme function. Actually, this part, even though I miss it, but it's a crucial part. This, but, uh, I, I'd better not tell you detail because, but I struggled with it for a long time because somehow it has three terms. Uh, actually, one of the terms is actually decreasing, but the other term you don't know. But it, fortunately, the, the other term multiplies the first term. When you multiply it together, it's increasing. So that, actually, that's quite it. Uh, anyway. So once, but this only tells you that the minimizer is radio symmetric, but why? That's a constant. Then, now you use Kazdan Werner type thing. That's normal. I mean, as long as it's a conformal, as long as you have conformal vector field, you have Kazdan Werner type condition. That's just an easy way to do. What does that say? It just say P Lu equal to minus chi Lu minus 7. Then, gradient chi dot with gradient xi, because this is a, this is a, uh, this is a, this is a conformal vector field on S3. They dot together, integral with this equals 0. So, suppose say it's, it's decreasing from the lost pole. You just take, x4 here, you see, the whole thing must be equal to zero, it's a constant function, right. So that's how the way it works. 
But the, the real hard part is, the real, in, the real key part is actually part three, which I do not want. If you, want, if you are interested, I can show you. So here, again, I want to emphasize, it's very important. When you do C-maturation, the C-maturation do not work for every test function. It only works for one function. That's a minimizer. So now, actually, this process of identifying minimizers is radio symmetry, then you do this. That's based on some of the work we, uh, I did with uh, Shadow One and Shadow Yen some time ago about uh, integral equation in conformal geometry. And the other idea of this, I mean, it only works for minimizers. It comes from Robert, who is a student of eBay. You see, when you study higher order QCO your problems in dimension at least five, you have always have a problem. You don't know whether the minimizer is positive or not. But the robot has an idea. He said under so many conditions, like the green function is positive, like the positivity of Panis operator, and the minimizer is achieved, then he proved he proved that the minimizer is positive. But his method only works for minimizer. Like our method only works for min minimizer, right? So that's uh, actually this. Is, you see, in general, you, you cannot expect to have a symmetry for all the fourth order operators. So every fourth op or every symmetry method for any fourth order op op operator is 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 important because every that that means every example counts, right? Okay, so. So that's about it. Uh, that's, that's about how you do the symmetry to prove the sphere. So now maybe I, let me take several minutes to explain the next one. I mean, if you want to prove the S3 satisfied condition double N, that's really easy. But it looks like the condition is really hard to check for other manifold. How that thing is achieved. This, okay, so this I will tell you what happens for general metric. In this case, it, it turns out for S3 is the easiest case. The remain case is actually much harder because you, you have no idea what's re really going on. However, I think two years ago, Paul and I actually proved that. So suppose in three dimension, so suppose you have a matrix with positive Q curvature. Then this soft living equality is true. That's a, a lesser than a sufficient condition is a second egg value is positive. That's a lesser than a sufficient condition is, is satisfied condition double N, non-negativity condition. You see, these are really hard to check. This is also hard to check, but this one is much easier. But they are equivalent, fortunately. So, no, okay. So, unfortunate. Unfortunately, we do not know. We do not even have an example when the second egg money is negative. Okay. So, but uh, I expect, I'm not really not sure whether there should be such kind of example. But at least you don't know that, so that means you, you may not always solve that. All right. So let me just uh, give one more word. The closure ingredients is actually de developed a lot long ago. That is actually for Panis operator. So what distinguishes Panis operator from any other fourth order op operators? If you have a fourth order operator, you want to ask what's the green function, you are dead. Because basically, there is no way. You only know its exi existence. But for this Panis operator, it has uh, one identity. It distinguishes it from other operators. That means you take the Green's function, then you take inverse, you take this as parametrics, then you find this identity. Now, you might wonder, OK, why is this identity important? Let me show you some consequence. The first consequence is this. If, if it has positive Yamabe class and the Q code is positive, then I can show the kernel of P is zero. You see, this is very non-trivial. Why? Because usually, how do you show the kernel of uh, elliptic operator is zero? You prove the first second value is positive. But the first second value here is negative. So, so you see, you cannot just multiply by energy to prove it's positive. That's not going to work. Besides that, the Green's function of P actually can be written down as an infinite series. Here, H is just uh, the, 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 the inverse of the Green's function of conformal Laplacian. The gamma one is a complete operator, but basically these are the rich curvature of the stereographic projection. Let me tell you actually what is this? Why this is related? This is just a Q curvature of the, of the stereographic projection metric. What's the convolution here? Convolution here, when you have, you see, on Rn you have convolution. 
but on SN or on general manifold, how do we do convolution? You cannot convolute the functions, but you can convolute the kernels. If you have two kernels, you multiply them, then you integrate out to the middle two. So that's called the convolution. So actually, this is actually based on some idea from Orban. You see, Orban many years ago, they proved the results. He write down the green function of Laplacian as infinite series. But in that case, it contains test functions. It contains cutoff functions, so it's not as clean as that, I would say. Right. Just one more word, then I'm done. So now, suppose you have this, take this gamma one, then you take this kernel. Once you have a kernel, you have an integral operator. So now you have this. There exists a matrix, conformal matrix with positive Q curvature. That's a condition I want to, I'm interested. That's the same as a conformal, the spectral radius of this operator is less than one. So why do you want to the spectral radius? Because the spectral radius is a conformal invariant. This is a very non-trivial, but a really complicated conformal invariant. So what's the, what's, what is the value of this operator on S3? It's zero. But away from S3, as long as it's less than one, you have that kind of matrix. And that's also if and only if Green's function is negative away from the pole. Away from the pole. So if it touches zero at the pole, that's S3. Otherwise, it's always negative. And based on that, you can easily solve the Q curve equation. Right. So actually, the second equation, you, you, if you have to do this, then you use that, that the previous identity again. So, but uh, that one is a little bit, uh, so maybe I want to skip that one. So anyway, so I want to emphasize the main point here is the following. Sometimes you still can do symmetry for higher order equation, but it only works for minimizers. And that still solves the problem. You don't have to do it for any other function because minimizer is the only thing you care. Right. Okay, so that's all for today. So if there's no more questions, let's thank our speaker.